Welcome to Building Birmingham Together, a show about Birmingham's business leaders' successes, failures, and lessons learned to encourage you to remember that dreaming is free, but the hustle is sold separately. I'm your host, Kim Lee, founder and CEO of Forge. Building Birmingham Together is brought to you today by Forge. Forge is Birmingham's first professional co-working space located in the heart of downtown Birmingham at the Pizzitz Building. With private offices, open workspace, as well as meeting and event space, Forge is the place where small business owners, entrepreneurs, and remote workers come together, meet new people, and get work done. If you would like to find out more about Forge, you can visit workatforge.com and schedule a tour directly on our website. Today, we have Ann Regal with us on Building Birmingham Together. Ann is the Director of Cooperative Downtown Ministries, um, more commonly known as the Firehouse Shelter, which is a nonprofit that provides comprehensive services to over 5,000 men, women, and children that are experiencing, experiencing homelessness every year. Throughout her tenure at the firehouse, Anne has moved the agency into a state-of-the-art emergency shelter, expanded capacity for permanent housing, and implemented research-focused programming to help stem the spread of communicable, communicable diseases. <laughs> That's a lot. Um, so today, I so look forward to learning more about the work that Anne is doing at the firehouse, as well as the journey that has led her to where she is today. So Anne, thank you for joining us. So glad to have you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so I said a lot in just those short a uh, couple introduction sentences, so I cannot wait to unpack it throughout the rest of the interview. Well, I'm excited to unpack it for you. Firehouse is doing some pretty amazing things, and I can't wait to share it. Yes, yes, thank you. So I'd love to start out our time today, um, and just if you could just give us a brief overview, <laughs> which I know that's a big question, um, of what the Firehouse Shelter does. Of course. So Firehouse is an agency where at our very core, our job is to help people um, end their episode of homelessness. So the Firehouse is affectionately known as the last house on the block, meaning when people have had doors shut left and right, when they've burned every single bridge uh, and come to the Firehouse, we open our doors wide and walk the path. Uh, alongside people, not uh, in front or behind, but we really work in kind of the trifecta of wholeness, which is mind, body, and spirit. We start off helping people at a crisis level, so we provide them a safe place to sleep at the shelter. We provide nice, nutritious, warm food in their belly and someone to talk to, and then as they start healing um, from their crisis intervention, that's when we work to start uh, so supplying permanent housing options. So we have a 50 bed transitional housing unit. We have a 24 bed uh, housing unit for men with severe mental health disparities. And then we have 70 permanent supportive housing beds um, and then low income housing for working families. So we really try to meet the needs of people alongside uh, every step of the way until they end their episode of homeless and are, are out in the community where they need to be. Well, I um, do want to unpack all of that because it is said in such a nice way, but I know it's so deep and rich what y'all do. But first, I would love to hear um, what led you to be at the firehouse shelter, your journey of getting to where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a career social worker. I've never done anything outside of social services since I was 17 years old. I've worked in lots of different organizations with lots of different people. My career started out um, working with the elderly and then I transitioned into battered and abused women for many years. Um, and then I really found after graduate school that my passion was in uh, mental health. And from there, it led me to getting a little bit restless. And so a friend sent me a job description for an opening at this place called the Firehouse, which I had never heard of before. So I showed up for my interview and it just so happened to be at dinner time. So I pulled up to the 
red brick building and there was a line of homeless men wrapped around the door. And to be honest, it was it was pretty intimidating. So I drove around the block a couple of times, finally made my way into a pretty unremarkable interview. But at the last part, the person who was interviewing me said that 50% of the staff was comprised of formerly homeless individuals with the majority having come through the firehouse themselves. And that made my little social work heart sing because that that's the type of place that I knew I wanted to be involved with the type of place where people spent their darkest times and hopeless despair. And when they got out, they were willing to come back every single day to help people um, in that same position. And I've been here at the firehouse since 2011. Oh, wow. So I know um, you briefly mentioned you were in mental health for a while. So that transition from serving in mental health to now, I mean, anybody who talks to you knows your deep, deep desire and passion to end homelessness and to help those who are in the cycle of homelessness right now. But was there a moment um, that you can think back to in, in the transition period to the firehouse shelter that really was that aha moment like, oh, this really is what I should be doing of um, passion towards the homeless population? Yes, actually, there was a gentleman named Steve. Um, many people might not recognize his name, but they might recognize him if they saw him from his many years walking around downtown barefoot, talking to himself, um, not interacting with anyone he was passing by just in his own little world. And Steve came to us to eat and I engaged in a conversation with him. And during that conversation, I got to see the true amazing person that was held within. Um, and I found out that he had been within the system his entire life, had a pretty traumatic upbringing um, that he told me all about. But then he started talking about his daughter and his face lit up and it was filled with pride. And I realized at that point that every person living on our streets has a unique story that they want to tell. And every person has promise and potential. Every person means something to, some, to someone else. And the firehouse helps people tell their story and they help get them back with their families. And it, they help, we help people realize that they are special. And I will say, just as an end to the saga of Steve, he has been successfully permanently housed for several years now. He is in contact with his daughter, and he's doing great. That's amazing. That's an amazing story. But what I love is just what I hear in you telling that story is just the dignity that every person bears and just your passion to bring that to light and to let them know that you know, the dignity that they have inherently in them and to help them tell their story um, is, is pretty moving. <laughs> Steve is just one of thousands of people that their stories are all different, but the common denominator is they're all incredible people. And that's one of the best parts about my job is just being able to restore a little bit of dignity and respect to their lives. Mm. So I know that um, in order to fight homelessness, there's so much more to be done than what, if people are in Birmingham are familiar with the firehouse shelter, the first things that come to mind are food and emergency shelter. Um, but there's so much more than just that that goes into fighting homelessness. So what, um, what are the things that the firehouse shelter is doing? And then what do you see as the vision for fighting homelessness in Birmingham through the firehouse shelter? The services we offer are pretty incredible and some of them are offered um, in-house with our staff, but a lot of the awesome programming we offer are people in the community that have a, have a passion to help. And so some of the really innovative things that the firehouse is doing to help end homelessness is first and foremost, 
advocacy on numerous different uh, on numerous levels that could be person to person ag advocacy community advocacy and then advocacy on a national level to help get the resources we need um, to assist folks in ending their episode of homelessness but on a more micro level here at the shelter um 68 percent of our population comes to us with one or more disabling conditions and those conditions might be substance abuse mental health disparities um, veteran status and certainly the majority of our folks are have been um, affected by the ravages of systemic poverty and so all of that is to say that our average client isn't a guy with a bachelor's degree in his back pocket who maybe just needs a little bit of intervention to you know, end his episode of homelessness and go back to his house and his family. Our average client needs a lot of information. They have a lot of barriers, a lot of self-doubt, a lot of struggles. And so we break down those barriers in a variety of different ways and we have to be creative about it. So one of the coolest things that we're doing right now is we have a fine arts program that we started about six months ago um, that includes everything from theater arts to spoken word. Um, there's a book club component where people read poetry that might affect them um, or allow them to, to be able to have a voice for their struggle. Um, and then multimedia mixed art, because that is a wonderful way to have people be able to express themselves. Um, we have a lot of folks that are at high risk of HIV and AIDS. So we have a a uh, partnership with Birmingham AIDS Outreach where they can get STI tested right here on site and go to groups about how to um, how to engage in different activities a little bit more safely. Um, we have a new partnership with the CDC working with respite care. So for folks that are discharged out of the hospital before they need to, really surrounding them with medical support. So those are just some little examples outside of the crisis services like case management and food services and a emergency shelter where they can get their needs met holistically. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that you said when we were talking earlier that um, really resonated is, you know, if you or I fall, we have some kind of support system, but these men that you're serving, if they fall, there's no support system. And y'all are working towards providing that support system. So could you tell just a little bit more about that and how you're accomplishing that for these men? Yeah, absolutely. It's easy to get into an us, meaning the housed, versus them, meaning the unhoused mentality, mm. where in fact, the big difference is a support network, because every single person that walks the earth has has failed at some, per, uh, at some point in their life. They've fallen, they need a helping hand to get up. And when you're extended that, that olive branch of grace and have that support network, your, your episode of whatever failure you might be experiencing ends quickly. But for our um, brothers and sisters that are living out on the street, they don't have that healthy support system for the most part. So that's the role that the firehouse and other agencies that work with the homeless we're we're a step in we provide that safety net and we tell them you know what it's okay it's okay if you messed up it's okay if you need a little bit of help and then as we nurture that relationship then in turn they eventually will be that support network for other people so it's a self-perpetuating positive cycle um and it, it starts at the firehouse yeah so what does it look like um if somebody was to I don't even know if this is the right term, but if they were to go through the program, I mean, what does a typical um, stay at the shelter look like? Right. So I think uh, the first thing that's important is firehouse is a low demand shelter. Mm -hmm. That means uh, oftentimes the people that are excluded from programming, even nonprofit programming, are the people that need it the very most. And so we take the folks that have 
are not eligible to participate in higher level um, programming and we welcome the, them in our shelter. Um, and we understand that if someone has been living on the streets for years, it's going to take more than 30 days for them to end their cycle of homelessness. So there is actually no cap on the amount of time that they can stay here. Now, internally, we like for people to move into some sort of housing, either within our program or another program, whatever is most suitable, within about 60 days, but oftentimes people aren't in the right headspace or they don't have the desire to make the change they need uh, to move in that direction. So they're more than welcome to stay here as long as they're not violent, they don't do drugs or alcohol on property, and they don't trash the shelter. So there's very, very basic rules that provide a safe space for everyone while allowing people to operate on their, um, on their own timetable. But the second someone says, I'm interested in housing, that's that's where really where we really spring into action because the emergency shelter is never meant to be a permanent home for people. It's a springboard um, into more stability. So we're what's called a housing first agency. Mm -hmm. That means we've taken the old way of doing things and kind of turned it on its head. So years ago, if you were experiencing homelessness, it was pretty cookie cutter. You went from the street into shelter, shelter to rehab, rehab to two years of transitional housing, then transitional housing to permanent supportive housing. If at any point you messed up, so if you had a drug or alcohol relapse, if you got in a fight with the case manager, you'd be kicked out of the program, put back into the emergency shelter, and then the process would start all over again, right? So it's just a cycle and we weren't making any progress with getting people stabilized. So housing first means if someone is desirous of moving into permanent housing, we put them in there, let them get their feet under them, take a breath, and then we surround them with those supportive services. Um, so they're able to work on the big stuff with their addictions or mental health, their family reunification. Because to be quite honest, expecting people um, to be in the right headspace to work on some of those issues without being in a permanent uh, stable housing situation is ludicrous. None of us could do it. We all need to know where we're going to lay our head at night without a constant threat of upheaval. upheaval. And that's what we're able to do with our permanent supportive housing programs. But of course, for some people, they, they don't need all of that intervention that has no time cap. For some people, maybe um, they just got released from prison or they're just out of rehab or their family life um, isn't a good fit for them at, at this point, they can go into transitional housing and they can stay in transitional housing for up to two years where they can work on getting their lives in order. And then at the end of two years, if it takes that long, they can uh, move on back out into the community. So it's kind of two different tracks depending on people's individualized needs. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I love that I know to be true, and it's very obvious in the way that you talk is um, the way that when, well, you said it at the beginning, how you come alongside of the men who come to you, um, but just the, the complete holistic approach that you take with them and that each person um, is an individual and they have their own needs and you want to work with that individual to put them on a path for them to be successful, whatever success means for that individual person, um, which is not easy. <laughs> it is not easy. It can be expensive, um, emotional, labor intensive. But the fact of the matter is, if we don't do the work, then who will? Yeah. You know, we're, we're the end of the line and that is what our mission is. And that is where we want to be because the onus is on, on us to look at people as an individual and assist them in making healthy behavioral changes. We can't and don't want to push it off on someone else. So it's, it's hard, but it works. We have some of the best success rates in the entire community because of our holistic approach. So I know... <laughs> Um, that, that it is, it is very hard work and very emotionally draining and taxing, but 
just listening to you now and anybody who talks to you about this knows how passionate that you are and your love just pours out for people. But you have a story where you have gone from a social worker uh, and one and you know a couple of different fields and now into homelessness and now the executive director of the organization. So it's a whole nother hat. So one, um, this is a twofold question. One, how do you, I mean, anybody listening to this podcast has things that they deal with, but the emotions that you're dealing with are so heavy. So how do you deal with that and still keep your passion alive and true, you stay true to that calling? And then how was that transition from social worker to now social worker with a huge heart and leading an organization? <laughs> Well, the first part of the question is a little complicated because I don't think I've mastered it 100%. I have a really hard time taking off my firehouse hat and putting on my Anne and the in the regular community hat because uh -huh. I believe in our mission and I believe in the men that we serve and I adore every single staff person that works under the firehouse umbrella. Um, but you're absolutely right. It is emotionally draining to the point where sometimes you don't realize that you're running on empty. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's my process is learning how to identify when I'm empty quicker. Um, so I don't uh, bottom out, I guess. And what I personally do, my family is incredibly important to me. I have a fabulous 16 year old son and a couple of dogs and a couple of cats and I spend some time outside where I can really take take the time I need um, to energize myself and to realize what I'm fighting for like this world it's not it doesn't end with our generation right it's the next generation and the generation after that that we're making the world better for so spending time uh, with the next generation always helps with so my son and his friends. Now, the second part of, of the conversation was, yeah, what it was like, sorry, that was a very loaded question, but <laughs> yeah. what it was uh, like, social worker to yeah. executive director, right? Well, a funny story is um, one of my very favorite people, a, a fellow executive director who I consider a very close personal friend sat me down when I first became executive director in 2013 and she asked what my background was and when I told her I was a social worker she laughed and she said you know social workers make the worst executive directors you'll <laughs> never make it and at first I was kind of like oh, hold on now but I realized what she was saying. It's because social workers are trained to think with our hearts and mm -hmm. a nonprofit on the other hand and, and leading a $2 million organization, you can't just lead with your heart. There has to be um, a balance. And so finding that balance, once again, it's a little bit of a process, but I realized that no matter what function I play in this organization or in our community, we all have specific roles that are equal. So even though I don't get to spend that time sitting down with people and doing case management or, or linking them up to services, my role is equally important because I make sure that my amazing staff has what they need to function appropriately. Mm -hmm. And so that's been what's helped me the most is realizing um, that I'm a cog in a much larger wheel and, and it's all interconnected. So, yeah, well, I know that had to have been a big transition, which I'm sure you still fight, you know, the balance between your first love and now your new role that you still, you know, you're still serving, but just having to take on a different role to accomplish well, the same purpose. Yeah, I, I have, but I also going back to like how I avoid burnouts, a, mm -hmm. a thing that I do at work is I always leave 15 or 20 minutes of every single day to go sit at the front desk so I can talk with the front desk staff so I can greet people and answer the phone and be involved and engaged. And I, I get to have a different sort of relationship with the people that we serve that's also very fulfilling. So I didn't 
when I became executive director, I didn't totally throw off the mantle of direct service. And that's kept me sane through some pretty difficult stuff because what I ultimately love is, is serving people. Um, mm -hmm. And I couldn't just not do that. Right. So I know that there have been some pretty big changes at the firehouse. So I'd love for you to share with us uh, some of the things that have happened during COVID that people may not even know about. Yeah, absolutely. So many people know the firehouse is the red brick building um, down the street, line of homeless men uh, hanging out outside. And the history of the firehouse is actually really fascinating. It was an actual old firehouse um, building that was built in the late 1800s, I believe, served wow. as a working firehouse until I believe the 50s. And then it ended up as a storage facility for city of Birmingham, like broken down furniture and stuff. And then during the mid 80s, firehouse moved in on the upper level. So there was homeless men on the top and broken down furniture on the bottom until we took over the entire shelter. And that shelter served us so well. We used it for our purpose um, as much as we could, but the fact of the matter is it was really hard convincing people that there was something better um, if they made some really tough changes when they were housed in this crumbling facility. Oh, and yeah. um, it just, people didn't need to be housed there. No matter how hard we tried, it was still, it was, it was, failing us as an agency. So the community came together and we built a gorgeous new facility. It was a design build process. So we were able to make every single inch, every single square foot of space specifically for the purpose of serving the chronically homeless. And in this building, we were able to double our capacity to 100 people. Uh, we have classrooms and a computer room and medical rooms. We have tiered housing, meaning um, people that aren't ready to make a change can always come in and have a bed. No uh, obligation to do anything. It's just a safe place, which is important because oftentimes those are the the people that are found um, as victims of violence or dying of hypothermia. So we always wanted to make sure we had a spot for those folks. But for the guests that were willing to start making changes, they have nicer facilities, more privacy, lockers with locks, um, just a place that, um, that works to make a sustainable change. Like physically, we have like a lot of uh, intrinsic motivators built into the building. We have mm -hmm. space for folks coming out of the hospital and our respite care. We have space for people that are working um, third and fourth shifts. They can come in 24 hours a day with blackout windows so they can sleep throughout the day, you know, with what their schedule is. We have housing for emergency housing for women. Um, so if someone comes, if they're fleeing from domestic violence or the female shelters are full, they can spend a couple of nights with us while we get them to whatever uh, facility might be a better fit, but we don't have to say, sorry, you can't stay here. And we have housing for youth ages 18 to 24. Um, Pre-pandemic, we had over 300 youth in that demographic um, that came to the shelter, many first time homeless, Mm -hmm. Lots of kids with Asperger's diagnosis, um, aging out of foster care, a lot of just really traumatic situations. We get a homeless shelter, no matter how nice it is, it's still scary. Yeah. So we wanted to have a place that was set up more like a college dorm uh, rather than a homeless shelter. So the new building has allowed us to even tailor down to the physical structure of the building, that individuality that we've been talking about. And of course, the entire building is set around a huge open courtyard where people can be outside in a safe place and talk with their friends and have a snack and just not constantly have that panic of will I be chased off? Will I be harassed? Will I be made fun of? Will I have my stuff stolen? And that's probably the best thing about our shelter is giving that peace of mind. 
And it is beautiful. I wish, you know, somehow we could um, describe it in a way on the podcast <laughs> that people could understand how really amazing it is. Um, but now let me ask you this. Uh, since we are still in a pandemic um, and things are very different, can if somebody wanted to see the firehouse, could they take a tour or is that, I mean, I'm sure there's a virtual tour online. Yes. Yeah, so if people are interested in coming and walking the shelter, if you're interested in getting more engaged, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So what okay. we are, we're still in pandemic protocol. We wear masks, we socially distance, we do all that good stuff. But if there's just a couple of people who want to go on a guided tour, that's certainly something we can do. All of the information is on our website at firehouseshelter.com. Okay. And we'll also include that in the show notes. If you're driving or walking, you'll have an easy way to access it <laughs> besides just having to remember. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I would, everybody listening, I would definitely encourage you to go and check out the website. And if you, even if it doesn't, you don't feel your heart pulled towards serving at the firehouse shelter, I think just seeing and knowing what y'all are doing um, just impacts the way that you think about these men and women who are on the streets and how we can help serve them and bring dignity. And um, so I think it's, everybody should check it out. That's just my little plug. <laughs> but um, I do wanna ask you another question. So the title of this podcast is Building Birmingham Together. And so we love to look at the ways that different organizations, different businesses, what they're doing, how it is actually impacting the greater good of the city. So what um, do you see is the role that the firehouse shelter is playing um, in building Birmingham together? So that's a pretty easy question for me because I firmly believe with all of my heart that a city cannot move forward without taking all of its citizens along. Mm -hmm. If you only have one group of people that are moving forward, it's like building a house on sand. The foundation just isn't there. So Firehouse is one little piece of the equity puzzle that helps people that are at you know, the lowest of the low be lifted and taken along on the amazing journey Birmingham has been on and, and the future that we can build together if we are all invested in making sure everyone has what they need. And that's the main role um, I think the firehouse plays in, in Birmingham. We are an advocate and a resource and a center of support for people that have nothing else. Um, mm -hmm. And so even if you're not passionate about homelessness or you've never really thought about it, it's not just helping a homeless person. It's helping right. our entire community thrive and be the Birmingham I know we can be. Mm -hmm. So another question that I always ask is um, lessons that you have learned through leading this organization that impacts your day-to-day -day decision making and life and how you run your organization. So my my favorite quote, the the mantra that runs through my head nonstop is this is not a dress rehearsal. Um, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> the decisions that I make are permanent. There is no do-over. And the firehouse business is life, right? Mm -hmm. We're a life-saving intervention. So the decisions I make have cast a wide net over a lot of people. And I have to work really, really diligently making sure I'm making informed, correct decisions because you don't get another second chance when you're dealing with people's lives. So what steps do you take? How do you, um, how do you, you know, make sure that you're making the best decisions in times that can be emotional and seem chaotic? I'm a constant information gatherer outside of times of crisis. Mm -hmm. I make sure that I'm having constant discussions with the key stakeholders. So I spend a lot of my time talking to the homeless folks that we serve. I spend a lot of time talking to stakeholders in the community, the staff. So when a crisis does come up, I can be well informed from a bunch of different perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really important because it doesn't just need to be what I think or my perspective. And I, I work really hard to challenge my opinions um, with other people 
And that allows me to try to make, and it doesn't always work, of course, but try right. to make correct informed decisions quickly by doing the, the heavy lifting ahead of time before I need it. So, yeah, which, you know, is so important for all of us. <laughs> yeah. As leaders, as, you know, running businesses, organizations that the work ahead of time is what's so important for the, in the moment decisions. Absolutely. Um, okay. Well, I have a few practical questions about the firehouse shelter. Um, so one, if somebody wanted to serve at the firehouse shelter, how would they go about what, what areas are, um, where could they serve and how would they go about doing that? That's such a great question. So pre pandemic, we had over 6,000 volunteers a year. It's amazing. We <laughs> rely very heavily on our volunteers to help specifically around um, meal time. So we serve about 120,000 meals um, and we hand out about a thousand articles in our clothing closet, which takes a lot of organization wow. <laughs> and a lot of time. And even though things have changed, processes have had to change because of the pandemic, the need doesn't. We didn't shut our doors one day. We're serving um, a lot of people every single day, but because of social distancing and um, making sure everyone has their needs met, it's even more work with no volunteers. So if you're interested, the easiest way to volunteer is to sign up to make meals in your home and drop them off. We have a touchless delivery system where you can just pull up in our alley, call a number, we'll come to your car and get it. We do bagged lunches and dinners for the guests. So peanut butter and jelly sandwich, bag of chips, bottle of water, pretty standard stuff that someone could put together in their own kitchen. Or if you like to cook, dropping off pans of lasagna and easy, easy to prepare things like that is incredibly helpful. You can find all that information on the website. There's a serve button where we even have calendars so you can pick your day. Um, the other uh, easy thing that we really, really need is collections of necessary items like tennis shoes and um, and underwear for our guys. You know, we run a laundry service out of the shelter, but we have so many people that are street homeless um, that need shoes and clothes and their camps get cleaned out so they lose all of their uh, wardrobe Um that would also be another really helpful thing to do. And we have lists of things that we need on our website as well. So if people are providing food, if I'm like, oh yeah, I want to, I can cook a meal. How, how much are they cooking? Like, do you, how, how, what do you ask people to prepare? So it depends for the bagged lunches, you know, you can do 30 at a time. So nothing huge. Our meals, we serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner to our folks that are staying here at the shelter and usually that's about 75 people. So you could either get the ingredients and drop the ingredients off or do, that's why big pans of pasta or lasagna or things like that, that can feed a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, and then hopefully with the pandemic lift, people can come back and serve in our shelter, which is a really fun activity. It's great to bring people together to serve others. And it's important to get the kiddos involved, you know, yep. service is one of the most important components of childhood because it raises compassionate service-minded adults right. so that's our reality now but hopefully in the near future we can bring people back into the shelter to do that mm -hmm. so you've you've kind of answered this this last question is um what are your most significant needs right now yeah if our significant donate. needs right now are laundry detergent so I mentioned our laundry service, uh, street homeless folks can drop off their clothes. We'll wash it within 24 hours. Um, our sanitary precautions, we always need cleaning supplies, things like that. So we can keep the shelter nice and spotless. Tennis shoes and boxers are huge items of need. Um, I would say those are our primary needs at this point. Okay. Um, okay. I have a few questions that I didn't warn you about. <laughs> okay. The first question is, since this is a podcast and, um, I, I like to listen to podcasts. So I like to know, are there any podcasts that you do like to listen to? 
So I have not ever really been on a podcast oh. kick, except for I have, this is going to make me sound really weird, but I really, I like true crime stuff. Oh, I don't <laughs> think that makes you weird. I think you're in there with a whole bunch of people. <laughs> so when I listen to podcasts, yeah. uh, the only outlier is Gosh, I listened to the Ron Burgundy podcast as well, but I wouldn't recommend that to anyone. <laughs> I have not listened to that. I bet that is really funny. <laughs> it's so, funny. so on one, I wish I could give a bunch of like really smart responses, oh, no. uh, engaging, like life altering podcast, but no, it's either true crime or Ron, Ron Burgundy. <laughs> <laughs> which probably is a little bit more about myself than I should have disclosed. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. And another question, do you have any books that are like, have that you are your go-to books or have really impacted the way that you do your job? Yeah, actually. And once again, it's, it's not uh, the smart answer. There's a lot of uh, good books on um, homelessness and philanthropy and things like that. But I read Les Mis. Oh. when I was in high school and I have used that book hmm. um, and the storyline in my real life more than probably anything else. So obviously there's a difference between the French Revolution right. and the firehouse, but ultimately it's about people living in poverty and trying to stand up for a greater mm -hmm. good and be willing to give everything. And mm -hmm. so I read Les Mis probably once every six months. Um, wow. And it's just that that old classic resounds with me more than anything else. Yeah. Well, and thank you so much for being here, being on Birmi building Birmingham together today. I um, it's been a great conversation and I am just so thankful for the work that you're doing at the firehouse shelter, your compassion and drive to serve those who often just get overlooked in our community. Um, so thank you so much for the work that you do and, and helping us see where we can serve and how we can make Birmingham a better place. So thank you. Thank you so much for allowing me to come on and share our story. Um, Homelessness is a community effort and it's a community problem. So if we all band together and support the people that need it the most, we're all going to be stronger. So thank you for allowing me to have this platform. Yeah.